first I try to make sure they were ready to do it in the first place. Um, you know, I don't necessarily take my own counsel uh, here, but mm. my advice to particularly younger entrepreneurs is, you know, you got to put in your time. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that I considered my 10 years at Deloitte an apprenticeship. Um, that's really what it was. I, I didn't, I didn't roll out of bed, um, you know, at 25 and start Calypso. Right? I, I put in a decade learning the industry, developing my own skills, um, developing a, a management model and a leadership philosophy that was the foundation of that firm. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the uh, founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where we focus on helping startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com. We're always happy to chat. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, Bill um, Poston. Is that right? Poston. And uh, Bill is a graduated and undergraduate in the middle of the oil bus in the mid 1980s in Texas, um, but did graduate and do everything, you know, everything right, quote unquote, graduated, but there weren't any pro job prospects. So he's figured, hey, why not? Uh, why not go do something fun? Let's go to Hawaii and work at resorts for a period of time. Did that for a little while and then came back to uh, Texas, got an MBA worked with Deloitte um, for a period of time and then left and uh, I think and started his own thing with a partner that, or a business partner that he knew from Deloitte and then uh, wanted to uh, get into consulting uh, or to help people doing consulting and consulting firms with um, a lot of the background that they had with Deloitte and eventually launched what they're doing now, which is uh, launchbox.com. So with that much as a, a quick introduction, welcome on the podcast, Bill. Thanks, Devin. Glad to be here. Oh, glad to have you on. So I gave that uh, kind of brief or quick walkthrough of uh, of your journey, but now take us back a bit in time to graduating in Texas with the the oil bust. Yeah, so it it all starts uh, you know, back at, at the undergraduate level in Texas. Uh, you know, I I felt like I had done all the things that you were supposed to do as a college student, right? I graduated with honors. I had a managerial job uh, working in hotels while I was an undergrad. I was an officer in student organizations. Um, but, you know, probably somewhat similar to people that were coming out in the great financial crisis or maybe last year, uh, the prospects were pretty limited. Um, you know, I, I got job offers making less money than I was making in my college job. <laughs> and so, mm. um, Rather than just kind of roll with the, the market at the time, I just said, you know, I'm going to go wait this recession out in Hawaii. Um, so you can call it my working gap year that turned into four. It uh, turned out to be an amazing experience. Had a, a fantastic mentor uh, in the business while I was there. Met my wife. Um, before coming back to Texas to, to go back to business school. So that was a little, a fun little aside. So, and, and so four years was a fun little job. What made you decide, okay, I've, I've had enough of a break or I've waited a lot, not long enough time. I'll go back to Texas and get the MBA kind of what made the, the prompt of that transition a bit. I mean, I had worked myself into a pretty big job um, running an 800 room hotel and at 25 years old, could see the top of that industry. I mean, it wasn't too far from where I was to get to essentially the top of the, the hotel business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was probably three steps removed from about as big a job as you can have in that industry uh, and just didn't really see the potential uh, for me to stay there and make it a career. All right. No, definitely makes sense. And uh, you're saying, okay, I've got to figure out what I'm going to do long term. So you go do that and you go back and do the MBA and you, and you get that. And, uh, you know, now you're coming out of getting the MBA. And I, I think you went to Deloitte after that. Is that right? Kind of doing, was it sure. finance or marketing? Remind me what you did at Deloitte. I, I, was, I was a management consultant at Deloitte uh, for 10 years. Um, worked helping our clients improve their product development capabilities. Um, and that really became... 
I, I consider that to be my apprenticeship, right? Mm. When, but you go back to school when you don't know what you really want to do with your life. <laughs> and when you graduate from graduate school and you still don't know what you want to do with your life, you become a consultant. I mean, it's, <laughs> Uh, so I, I figured that would give me the opportunity to have a diversity of experiences and, and learn a lot more than I ever could in a classroom. Uh, and I just fell in love with the lifestyle. I mean, I fell in love with the, the pace. I fell in love with the travel, uh, the diversity of experiences. You know, every client, every city is a new challenge. Um, you're continually learning, continually faced with, uh, with new problems. Hmm, definitely makes sense. And it sounds like it'd be a fun, rewarding and, and kind of a, a good opportunity to, to learn quite a bit and see how others do it and, and gain that experience. And so now you do De Deloitte and how long did you how long did you work at Deloitte for? I was there for 10 years. So you do Deloitte for 10 years, get some good experience, get a or get a bit of the lifestyle, get a see a lot of things, do a lot of things and kind of go through that. Now, what kind of prompted you as you were leaving Deloitte to kind of leave there, go do your own thing and also pull in one or pull in your business partner that you knew from Deloitte? Yeah, I mean, my one of my six word memoirs is uh, big decisions were made for me. Hmm. And I, I felt like uh, in the wake of the shakeup, uh, in big five management consulting, you know, if you recall the industry transition where most of the, the big integrated accounting and consulting firms separated uh, in the wake of Enron and WorldCom and the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, mm -hmm. legislation, Deloitte remained an integrated firm. Um, and I felt that, you know, at that time, it was uh, about as, as good an opportunity as any uh, to go out and, and launch our own thing. Hmm. No, so makes sense. And uh, so now so now you've got that realization, okay, I kind of the timing's right. I'd like to go do my own thing and, you know, looks or looks exciting and good to me. Now, as you're kind of doing that, did you have a business in mind? Did you already have it all lined up? Did you have no idea and you just figured you'd go out and do something or kind of how did you make that transition or kind of decide where you were going to land or where you were going to go as you, as you shifted yeah. to go out on your own? No, I mean, we had a pretty clear idea of what we wanted to do. We started another management consulting firm named Calypso and we uh, were doing product development to work for our clients, helping them improve their ability to um, innovate and bring new products to market. Um, we, you know, we were really worried about things like who's going to hire us, you know, how are we going to get clients, who's going to want to work for us, how are we going to attract talent. Um, those things turned out to be easy. I mean, we had clients from day one and never had a problem with demand. Uh, we also never had a problem attracting talent. It, it turned out that all the big things we were worried about, we didn't have to worry about. Those were easy. Mm. Um, it was all the stuff we didn't know anything about that turned out to be really a, a major pain. Um, you know, and I just mm. consider that the, the administrative burden of launching and running a business, right? What, mm -hmm. We, we got to have health insurance, you know, for us and our employees, you know, how do you set up a 401k plan? Who's going to keep the books? Um, state tax issues. I mean, it's just you know, a, a mind boggling mess of administrative stuff that keeps you out of the market, right? Retards your ability to really focus on growing the firm by recruiting and selling and, and developing the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. So, so now you, you get there, you kind of, Hey, we have a pretty good roadmap. Was it when you were exiting? Was or was the your business partner had he already exited? Have you guys planned it together? Where you know you'd already kind of or how did that work out? That you're saying, hey, I'd like to pull someone in and and have them and someone to to help to to get this launched. Yeah, I mean, we developed the concept together. Um, he uh, had an opportunity to um, leave Deloitte before me, um, mm -hmm. just based on his circumstances, and so. He went out and started the business uh, and got it up and running probably, I think, about nine months uh, ahead of me. Um, so he was he was there keeping my seat warm. 
No, it makes sense. So that that makes it nice to have the warm seat that you can just uh, sit down into and, and uh, get to work. So so now you do that, and then you guys are out on your own. You're you're getting you're building it, and you mentioned a little bit. You know, it was uh, things that you didn't know that you know were the things that you had to figure out. And you know, and then I think everybody hits in there. You had to figure out health insurance, where you're going to have the building, what the rent's going to be, who or if you need to hire people, where are you going or how you going to set up payroll, how you going to do all those janitorial things and everything else and those are all the things you never really think about but always have to get done but as you're getting that um, kind of taken care of and done you know how how did things go as you now had the opportunity to go out on your own kind of build things was it a raving success and just took off like wildfire was it a slow growth and kind of how did how did that evolve yeah i mean we we with the with the exception of 2009 you know when the whole industry took a step back we were pretty much on a straight line trajectory up and to the right. You know, we grew the business mm -hmm. year over year, every single year. Um, we're financially successful every single year. Um, had a phenomenal team and the ability to attract the best people um, in the industry to, to work for it. So, I, you know, as I look back on those early days where we were, you know, working our tails off and going at it seven days a week, um, that's that's the, the nostalgic view of that is that was the good times, right? That was the fun building um, and, and growing this business. Uh, mm. And what I what I learned about myself is you know, I'm much more um, in the zone and and much more effective in that starting and growth stage mm -hmm. than I am at you know running a mature business. No, definitely. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I think there there is a lot to, to be said for that. And it's, you know, one of the one of my favorite books, not like a lot of books was um, it was on that. It's called That Will Never Works by Mark Randolph, that was the original founder of uh, Netflix. And, uh, you know, it kind of talks about how, you know, you start out a business and you need a lot of generalists, you need a lot of people that are good at doing a lot of different things and wearing multiple hats and kind of doing things. And then as the business matures and kind of gets out of the startup growth phase, small business and into a larger business, then you start to switch over from, you know, generalists to specialists and how everybody now has their specialized role. And oftentimes a person that's great at or having the idea of growing and launching the business is not necessarily the same one that's now going to take the realm as it moves into an operational business. And it kind of, sure. you know, adjusts and transfers from that. And it's, it's interesting how oftentimes time that overlays with a lot of businesses is hey i'm a great at starting a business it's exciting it's fun and i enjoy it and then as it gets bigger and it gets more operational and it's less of that exciting kind of startup mode how some people make that transition and love it and other people are saying i want to go back to doing the startups and do the fun stuff again and so it's always kind of that mix up so now you did that for a period of time you did the you know did it with your business partner and then you guys or you transition over into the business you're doing now which was there's launchbox.com was that part of the same business Business? Was it with the same business partner? Did you go out on your own, do your own thing, or kind of how did you make that sure. transition or adjustment? So we we sold Calypso uh, in 2020, and my business partner stayed with the firm. So he's now working uh, same job with Calypso, but with the acquirer. Um, mm -hmm. Sold that business to Rockwell Automation at the end of April of last year. So almost exactly one year ago. Oh, cool. um, and the natural thing would be to go do it again, right? So we spent 16 years building a business. Uh, we had no money at the start. We didn't know what we were doing. We had no experience. So clearly we can just go do this again now that we actually <laughs> know what we're doing and have the money to do it. Mm. Um, but as I thought about it, I said, why would I just want to start one new firm when I can help other people start firms? So. The, that's really the notion behind the launch box is, you know, if, if it took us 16 years to, you know, start scale and sell this business with no money and no real experience, can we take capital and experience and, and strategic know-how and help other people short, um, you know, short circuit that cycle and start scale and sell a business in half the time? Uh, and instead of doing it once, let's do it 20 times, right? Go find young, um, uh, ambitious entrepreneurs that have a desire to start a professional service firm and give them the freedom and the flexibility and the capital uh, to go do that. Um, and 
kind of take the headache away of all that administrative nonsense that I mentioned earlier uh, that, that I had to do when we started our firm and just let them go focus on selling, delivering and managing their people. Hmm. No, and I think that, you know, that that sound kind of sounds like, you know, fun, exciting on both sides in the sense that for the people that are wanting to offload some of that or not have to deal with that, you know, gives them an opportunity to focus on what they're good at. And on the same time, it gives you, hey, I can go and figure, do that. You work with a lot of businesses, have a lot of impact and kind of get in there without rather than do, as you mentioned, one, you can do multiple. So that, that sounds like a, a fun, a fun arrangement on both sides. So as you've, as you launched that and it's been about a year or so, or at least since you left uh, Eclipse. So how has it gone? Has it been fun and rewarding? Has it been more difficult? You know, oh, question is oftentimes when you get into a second startup, is that easier, harder than uh, what you do? You know, is it easier the second time? Is it about the same or kind of, how does that turn out? So how did that go for you? Yeah, so it's really only been about four months. I mean, I I, I uh, played quite a bit uh, in 2020 uh, while the world was you know somewhat on hold, um, but we laid the groundwork for the launch box and you know put the plans in place, uh, but really started in earnest in January, and we're off to the races. We've started three new firms. Um, a cybersecurity consulting firm, a marketing consulting firm, and more of an advertising agency, the three businesses that we've launched so far. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting accustomed to working again. You know? So, you know, when you go from 80, 100 hours a week to 10 hours a week uh, for a year or so, getting back to 80 or 100 hours a week uh, requires a little bit of a transition. Um, but unlike the first go round where I was taking out the trash and making the coffee and keeping the books and selling the work and delivering the work, uh, I now have a luxury of having an amazing team to support me. Um, and it's been, it's been tremendous amount of fun, um, but a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of work. And um, <laughs> they're, 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 they're now screaming, slow down. Um, we started three firms and, you know, four months and or less than four months. So they would like to let these settle in as they that's their their turn. Let's let these settle in a bit uh, before we do another one. Uh, it's a pretty good pace. So I don't know that I blame them as far as wanting to at least catch their breath before you jump onto the next one. But at the same time, that that's some of the fun of it is to to. Uh, try new things out, uh, you know, get things up and running, do it a different way, do it the, your own way and, and have a fun time at it. So I get both sides of the, of the coin. So, well, as we now, that kind of brings us up to where you're at today. And so now we'll kind of transition a bit to the two questions I always ask about your journey. Um, so the first question I always ask is along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made and what did you learn from it? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a perfect transition for my team saying, Hey, let's slow down. Um, because, you know, as I think back on the bad business decisions that I have made over my career, um, they all are, uh, a result of wanting to go too fast, right? Mm -hmm. They're a result of seeking growth, uh, in somewhat of an unnatural way at an unnatural pace. Um, and maybe probably the, the biggest, most glaring example of that is when we were running Calypso, we made a decision to expand into Europe uh, early mm -hmm. on. So we were probably less than $10 million in revenue, um, you know, 30 or 40 people in the United States. And we thought it would just be a really brilliant idea to go global. Um, you know, we looked at the EU market, said, yeah, it's not, it, it's, you know, the consulting market is probably two thirds the size of the United States. So let's go tackle it. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it's not that we weren't successful there. We, we were successful, but the management time and attention and distraction factor associated with trying to tackle what is not a market, right? It's a few dozen different markets. Um, mm. It's just a mistake. I mean, if all that time and energy would have been much better um, used growing the business at home. Um, hmm. 
No, so. definitely, definitely makes sense. And uh, you know, it's always it's always hard in the sense that you see opportunities and you say, okay, this can be great opportunity. It's going to be a great market. And sometimes it is, and other times it's, hey, you know, it's one where I don't understand the market as well, or I have to adapt to it, or it takes a lot more time to get, uh, you know understanding of it or come up to speed or to adapt to it so it's always one of those as to where to put the focus where to put the effort and where to build and so it's always an interesting one where sometimes it works out sometimes you learn good lessons from it and then both times it's, it's fun along the way so it definitely makes sense so but, now uh, we'll dive to the oh the, we'll dive the to learning the go ahead the learning to say no lesson is one that i keep learning over and over again <laughs> <laughs> i just <laughs> I mean, if, if I could learn to say no uh, to more things, I'd probably be happier and richer. No, and I, and I, but I think that that's a little bit of a lot of the entrepreneur's dilemma in the sense that a lot of times you have a lot of great ideas, a lot of things sign, or look exciting. There's a lot of things where you think you can have an impact and be, make a difference and do it differently. And so you oftentimes will have too many things that you oftentimes will want to do or you overcommit or you don't say no and it has that drawback and a detriment but you know it's, it's still it's still hard to say no so i definitely get that so now we'll dive to the the second uh, question i always ask on the end of the podcast which is if you're talking to somebody that's just getting into a startup or a small business what'd be the one piece of advice you'd give them i mean first i'd try to make sure they were ready to do it in the first place um you know i don't necessarily take my own counsel uh, here but hmm. my advice to particularly younger entrepreneurs is, you know, you got to put in your time. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that I considered my 10 years at Deloitte an apprenticeship. Um, that's really what it was. I, I didn't, I didn't roll out of bed, um, you know, at 25 and start Calypso. I, I, I put in a decade learning the industry, developing my own skills, um, developing a, a management model and a leadership philosophy that was the foundation of that firm. So number one is, you know, be prepared. But then once you leap, go fast. Right? I mean, I, I work with a lot of people that um, they are never quite ready, right? The product is never mm -hmm. perfect enough. Um, and in innovation, we use the concept of minimum viable product and say, you know, get it out there. We're, we're not gonna improve it in a conference room or in a laboratory. We're gonna improve it by making it work um, and mm. you know, fixing it in market. Um, no, and I think there's a lot of, I mean, now you don't wanna put out the crappiest product you can. So, you know, you always have to balance a minimally viable product with a good product. But I always tend to agree that it's in the sense that most of the time you're always wanting to be perfect. You're wanting to just have this one extra feature, make it just a little bit better and improve it here because it'll make a big impact. And yet you hold it off so for so long that one, you're not getting valuable feedback from the market. You're not, a, a, you, you know, you could go put it out there, see how people react and maybe you're way off or maybe you need to adjust things or maybe it's spot on and you could be making money earlier or maybe you get the funds that you can then, you know, reinvest and do a generation two and three, but all of which until you get it out there and you start to overcome those excuses as to why it's not ready to introduce to the marketplace, definitely it can hold things back. So I think that's a great piece of advice. Well, this is a reminder to the listeners. We do also have the bonus question coming up after the normal episode where we'll talk a little bit about intellectual property. So for those of you that are interested, stay tuned for that. But as we wrap up the uh, normal part of the episode, if uh, people want to reach out to they want to learn more about your businesses they want to uh you know pitch you on a business they want to be in a client they want to be a customer they want to be an employee they want to invest in your business they want to be your next best friend any or all of the above what's the best way to reach out or find out more yeah so uh the launchbox.com is the website i um, love to, to have anybody go there learn more about the business um, easy to contact us there. You can also reach me directly at uh, bill at the launchbox.com. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage everybody to, to reach out, make connections, and uh, definitely utilize the wealth of knowledge uh, from Bill. So, well, as we wrap up, um, thank you again for coming on, Bill. It's been fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you that are listeners, if you have your own journey to tell and you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to have you. Just go to inventiveguest.com, apply to be on the show. Two more things as a listener. One, make sure to click subscribe in your podcast player so you know when all of our awesome episodes come out. And two, leave us a review so you know or others can find it find the awesome episodes as well. 
Last but not least, if you ever need any or ever need any help with patents, trademarks, or anything else, or have any questions, go to strategymeeting.com and grab some time with us to chat. So with that, we, it's always kind of a fun place to uh, or switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about the area that I, you know, that I, I tend to or hopefully have a little bit of expertise and intend to enjoy and, uh, and drill down on, which is intellectual property. So with that, on the bonus question, um, I turn it over to you. What's your uh, or your top or your number one intellectual property question? So we don't really work much in the area of patents, you know, mm -hmm. and, and products, right? But we do invest in brands quite a bit. And it, it's always a bit confusing to me around trademark protections and um, you know, what actually has to be registered in order to be protected and what level of protection you have simply by claiming it and using uh, you know, a phrase or a word or a brand or a mark, um, you know, in, in public. Uh, sure. I, you know, we spend a lot of time and money protecting these things, but then I often, you know, have attorneys tell me, well, you already own it. It's already yours just by virtue of using it, which begs the question, then why the heck do we have to register it? <laughs> Go tell those attorneys they need to do a better job. Explain. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there's some truth to it. So let me back up and answer a part of your first question. What you can typically protect with a trademark is anything to do with a brand. So that oftentimes falls into name of a company, name of a product, a logo, a catchphrase, or something of that nature. Something that is really people, anything that is identifying a source of goods or services. In other words, they know when they see whatever it is that it's your product or it's your service being offered. And in a, in a large sense, that's what can be protected with a trademark. And so, you you know, there are ones that, you know, as an example, smell of Play-Doh. That's been trademarked in the sense that everybody, when they smell Play-Doh, they know they think of Play-Doh that, they, you know, that's a product. And you have colors that have been trademarked for different vehicles and, and sports arenas and different things. So it does, it kind of goes beyond that. So if you're thinking of, hey, if somebody's associating with this brand, when they see it, they hear it, they smell it, whatever they think of our brand, you can generally protect that with a trademark. Now, the second part of the question is more on, you know, what necessarily, what can you protect or, you know, is it worthwhile to file a trademark? So generally they, they're right. The attorneys that tell you that are right to a degree that inherent in using a trademark, you have some what are called common law rights or state law rights. And so when you start to use it, if, if you're the first one to use it for a given category or class of goods and, you know, for the a type of uh, product or service, then you have those inherent rights. But where it is, is it is a limited amount of rights based on your geographic location where you're using it. So let's say it is an example, you start up a business and we'll say it's a, a local restaurant, just as an example, and you go to Chicago and you start the business and you, you know, you name it this, you start to use it, you're the first one to use it. And you have the rights to that in that geographic location. So in Chicago, or maybe it's only a few blocks, maybe only service a few blocks, but whatever that area that you're selling your goods or services to, that's where you own it. Now, the problem is, is if somebody comes along and they register the federal trademark or register trademark, they are the presumptive owners of all of that using of that mark outside of your geographical location. Meaning, yeah, you can keep yeah. doing it in Chicago and keep selling it there. But let's say if you ever wanted to expand or you wanted to franchise or you wanted to be a nationwide brand or anything else, you're now stuck. You're no longer able to expand. You're no longer able to go anything. And then you can also get in there. And then it gets in the question of if, you know, there's a lot of presumptions that come with the federal trademark of who is using it first and who owns it. So then you can also get into what what is that geographic location? Who started using it first? How are you using it? And so while there are some limited inherent rights to just by the fact of using it with common law rights, they're pretty limited. And most of the time when you get into it, it's, you know, let's say you were a mom and pops or a local store, but now you get into a point it grows, you know, expands beyond your wildest dreams in five or 10 years and you want a franchise or you want to go sell it or somebody wants to acquire it. And now they're saying, well, yeah, do you have this protected? Well, we got common law rights. And I say, well, those are, you know, pretty weak. And so it has a lot of those drawbacks. So in a sense, they are right, but it's a much more limited set of protections that you have such that it de or, uh, for most businesses decreases the value quite a bit of the trademark. Super. That's helpful. 
So with that, there's a number one, or answer to your number one intellectual property question. And if you or any of the audience ever has any other questions, as I've already mentioned before, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we can go over anything else on your mind. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap up the podcast. Thank you again, Bill, for coming on and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thanks, Devin.